So good morning, everyone, once again. Um, first and foremost, I want to commend you all for signing in on time and being present for our classes and for the consistency. And I hope that in the upcoming weeks, we, um, we continue being punctual to class so that we could get as much work done as possible. As you all know, our classes, um, our online classes will end on Saturday, the 2nd of May which would be our last class um, here. And uh, during the break, I'll talk to you more about um, the poster that Flitton sent in the WhatsApp group for you all. So today's class, we will be continuing with narrative writing. So um, I'll be wrapping up narrative writing this week because next week I want to get into the paper three where we will be um, exploring um, past papers analyzing the comprehensions, the poems, advertisements, and so on. And also giving you all an idea as to how your responses should look when you answer the questions in paper three. So today, today's session will be very interactive where um, in the past we have discussed the different elements of a short story. So do you all remember any um, elements of a short story? Anyone remembers? There are different elements that I gave you all on the first handout when we, when we completed narrative writing. There are different elements that must be present in a short story. Do you all remember any? I'll give you a hint. One is on my screen right now, setting. So setting is mandatory when we are creating a short story. We must have a setting in our story. The readers must get an idea as to um, where the story is taking place and also the time. So setting is focused on time as well as location or place. So that's one thing that we must have in our story. We must have a setting. Oh, so Shmuta is saying the rise in action, yes. And the rise in action falls under what element, Sushmuta? Where would we find the rise in action? Just in the middle. In the middle, but that falls under a particular element. Do you remember the element? It starts with P. Plot? Yes, plot. So in the element of um, plot, we have five different stages. So we have the exposition, then we have the rise in action, then the climax, the fall in action, and the resolution. Um, Rihanna is saying that character, so yes, every story must have characters. So just remember that the characters could be human beings, they could be animals, or they could also be things that are personified. So good, we must have the plot, we must have a setting, we must have characters. Anything else a story must entail? Any other element you all remember? You can either unmute your mics and tell me, or you could send this on the chat. Anything else you all remember a story must entail? Yes, so Rihanna says dialogue, yes. At some point in time, we must make our characters talk. And dialogue is extremely important because it helps to bring life to our characters. Because we don't want the characters to just be present in the story and not contribute to any of the action that's taking place in the story. So good, Jada is saying theme. Yes, every story must have a theme. So the theme is a central idea. So what the story is basically about. So for instance, we have teams like friendship, love, loyalty. So there must be a team in the story as well. Very good. Um, Rihanna is saying style. Yes, yeah, so we have style and style has to do with um, how you write in terms of your vocabulary, phrases that you use, if you want to use literary devices. And everyone's style will differ. Any other element you all remember? So any other element of a short story? What's the part that gets the story really excited? It must have something in the story. It begins with C. Yes, so Jada said it, it's conflict. Every story must have some sort of conflict. So the characters must face conflict in the story, meaning that they must have to um, face an obstacle or overcome an obstacle, right? So the characters could be struggling with another character against a force of nature. So like for instance, if they're battling a hurricane, flooding, 
also characters could be um, struggling or having conflict within themselves. So we, they could experience inner conflict or even against society. And Rihanna also mentioned point of view. Point of view is, is also important because it tells us from whose point of view the story is being told. Very good. So today our session is going to be um, our session is going to be an interactive one where when I ask you all the questions and so on, um, I want you all to either unmute your mics and give the responses or you could um, send your response in the group chat. So we're going to be looking at a series of elements and saying some questions on them and also looking at how um, other people encapsulate the different themes, the different setting, the dialogue, the character in their description. So we're also going to be looking at how people write just so that you all can get an idea so that um, when it's time for you to write, you would know exactly how to write about setting or how to write about a character or conflict or how to use dialogue and so on. So the first exercise is on setting. So it says read carefully the following extract and answer these questions. So what I want of, um, you all to do is that we'll be looking, I'll be giving you all a few minutes to think of your responses for letters A to F. So you could jot it down into your English notebooks and then we would, um, we would answer the responses together. And I will be calling on you all to um, give me responses for each of the letters, right? So as you all know from doing comprehension, poems and so on, when you're given questions on a passage to read, I always recommend that you read the questions first because when you read the questions first, you are no longer going into the passage blindsidedly. Now, with, with the questions, you have a sense as to what you are looking for. So let's read our questions first, and then we will read the paragraph. And I will call on you all to give me the responses for A to F. So while we are reading, or even if you see something, um, or even if you, you see an answer for a question, I want you all to jot it down into your English notebooks, right? So we're going to read the questions first for this exercise. And after you read the questions, I'll be giving you all some time to jot down your responses as well. So the questions are, A says, what time of day is it? And we know that with um, setting, it always includes the time of day. B says, what is the location? C, what details of the setting are mentioned? D, what mood does the setting evoke in you? E, what is the dominant impression and how is it created? And F says, what can you predict from the atmosphere about the development of events? So basically the plot. So let's read the, um, the paragraph and then we would answer the questions. If while I'm reading you come across an answer, you could jot down your answers in your English notebooks. And after I read the paragraph for you, I will give you all a few minutes to jot down your responses and then I will randomly select you all to give me your feedback. So it begins by saying, the silence was profound. The night animals had gone into hiding and the day ones were still reluctant to come out into the open to start their early morning business. Ojebeta and her brother were not unaware of the animals' sleeping, movement, sleeping movements in the thick walls of the green forest as the sudden noise of their footsteps startled one or two creatures into temporary wakefulness. Except for these minor signs, there was stillness everywhere. As they plodded through the bush tracks, they seemed to be entering the very belly of the earth, being swallowed by a dark, mysterious, all-green world, tangled branches of huge tropical forests, creeping plants, enormous tree trunks all entwined together to form the impenetrable dark green grove. So just from this paragraph, I want you all to jot down um, quickly just some responses for A to F. So did you figure out the time of day? So jot down what you think is the time of day. What is the location? If any details of the setting are mentioned. So a good thing would be to have your hand out on the very first class where we looked at the different elements so that you could remember the different details of the setting. D, remember the setting always evoke a mood in you and the mood has to do with um, a feeling. So how you are feeling, how the characters are feeling. E, what is the dominant impression? 
impression means like a feeling. So what a dominant meaning mean? So when you read this, what is the main feeling you get? And how is that created? What does the writer do to, to create that overall feeling in you? Um, F says, what can you predict from the atmosphere about the development of events? So if you had to predict this story based on the atmosphere that is described, from, um, that is described to you, what could you predict in the development of the plot? So we know that the setting is usually the first element of the story. So if you had to predict the rise in action, the climax, the fall in action, the resolution, what could you use from the atmosphere here that they have described to predict what could happen in the plot? So briefly, jot down your responses for A to F. And just remember oh, everything that you all have learned about the setting. The setting is extremely important because it helps to give us a sense about the place and time of the story. And when the place and the time are mentioned, it also helps to create the overall atmosphere. And even from the atmosphere and the descriptions, we could get a sense uh, about the writer's tone and even their mood. So pay attention to everything that you all have learned about setting thus far. Ask yourself, you know, about the features of the setting, if, it's, if they have selected details about time and place, if the setting is credible or realistic. So I'm sure by now you all have a fair sense as to how to answer these questions. I'm sure you all already have some responses for A to F. If you are unsure, we will clarify it when we are correcting. So which letter are you all on? Have you all finished A, B, and C? So you're just jotting on briefly your responses to the questions. Joanne, do you have a question? No. <laughs> what letter have you reached? D. D, okay, very good. So just remember, not all the time the setting would be directly stated. Sometimes they don't tell you the name of the place and then you have to just read the description to try and figure out where exactly the story is taking place. So try to read between the lines and see if you can figure out where exactly the story is taking place because not all the time they come out and directly put the name of the place for you. Sometimes you have to look at the descriptions and try to figure out, okay, where is the story set? So let's go with um, letter A. So when I call on you, you could either unmute your mic and give me a response, or you could um, send your message in the chat. So the first question is for Lena. Lena, are you with us? Yes. Um, I will say the night animals had gone to the into the hiding and the day ones were still reluctant to come out into the open to start their early morning business. Mm -hmm. So when you read that line, what time of day is it? Is it night? Is it lunchtime? Morning time? What time of day do you think it is? Um, I think early morning. Uh-huh. And what, and what yeah. do we refer to the early morning as? Wait, sir? There's a word that we use to refer to the early hours in the morning when the period is from night to early morning. There is a word that, that we refer to the early morning as. Do you know? No. It starts with D. D brick. Okay, so um, Steve, when is getting close, he said daybreak, not daybreak, there's our next word. Dawn. 
Dawn. Very good. Okay. We were this Dawn. So Dawn is a period when we have um, when we are entering from night and we're now entering into early morning, but the sun is not out as yet. So like it's just before sunrise. So the time of day here, we get a sense that the time that they are describing is dawn. And you, the lines that you pointed out, Lena, that was correct because they're telling us that the night animals just went into hiding and the morning ones are still reluctant to come out, which means that, you know, they're not waking up, they're not going to come out. So that time of day is dawn. Very good. Um, part B, question B is for Jada. What is the location? So in terms of place, where do you think the story is said, Jada? In the forest. Yes, and, where, and how do you know that? Because of the sentence. Miss, what is that person's name? Ojebeta and her brother. OJ Beta and her brother were not unaware of the animals' sleeping movements in the thick walls of the green forest as the sudden noise of their footsteps start, startled, startled one or two creatures in temporary wakefulness. Very good. So we, we know that the story is set in the forest because of when they say green forest up here. And even in the second to last line, when they said tangled branches of huge tropical forests. So the story is set in a tropical forest. Very good. Part C says, what details of the setting are mentioned? So Rihanna, what details of the setting are mentioned? Well, they talk about the forest and how it was silent uh -huh. and it was early in the morning. So I guess um, they probably left very early because they describe everything, what time they leave and how silent it was. All right, and when we describe it, what we hear and what we see, and what is that called, Rihanna? Um, <laughs> I know it has to do with um, um, I think is I don't know how to say it, but it's had to do with visual. And yes. um, I forget the I forget the other one. <laughs> yes, it actually has to do with imagery. And we know that there are five types of imagery, Anna. Do you remember? Um yeah, I have it right down somewhere. <laughs> Rihanna is supposed to be in your brain by now. <laughs> so we have um so the details of the setting that I mentioned, well, they, they did mention the time, the place, and other details would be like the sensory imagery. So sensory imagery comes from your five senses. So remember, we have five senses, what we see, hear, feel, touch, smell. So did you see any of those things being mentioned in the setting, Rihanna? Yeah. So what um, types of sensory imagery did you see? Did he mention what he saw? Well, the, um, yeah, they talk about um, imagery, and then they talk about um, scent. I think I'm not so sure. So remember, there are five types of imagery, right? The first one is visual imagery, so what you see. So we yeah, get a visual. sense as to what the person was seeing because they described it first, right? Did we hear about the auditory imagery? Did the person describe what they were hearing? Yeah, because they talk about the sudden noise of, yes. the, of the footsteps. Mm -hmm. And in the very first time when it says the silence was profound. Good. So we get a sense about what the person is hearing. In terms of smell, did the person describe anything about smell, how anything was smelling? I don't think so. Okay, good. Um, taste. Did, did he describe? No, 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 no. It wouldn't taste nothing. And touch. <clears throat> I doubt. No. So, so far, the only details of the setting was that they mentioned the visual imagery and the auditory imagery. And even other features of the setting, like the time and the place, were also mentioned. Very good. Um, part D is for Jolan. What mood does the setting evoke in you? 
So when you're already setting, what mood does it evoke in you, or what's the mood of the um of the paragraph? Um, like silence, early morning. Um, July answer and part D, and remember, mood has to do with a feeling. So your answer oh. has to be a feeling. So a feeling you 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 think um OJ better and her brother are feeling right now. Or you sleepy. Feelings, how are you feeling? No, I I miss I I don't know. <laughs> like, look, look, at the, um, <laughs> look at from um as Lonely. Yes, Stephen. What did you say? Lonely. They feeling lonely, yes. And look at the last um uh, I think it was fear. Yes, it was fear. Because if you all look at the descriptions, it paints a sort of frightening imagery. So when they said that they um they enter in the very belly of the earth being swallowed by a dark, mysterious green world, they mentioned the creeping plants, enormous tree trunks, the impenetrable dark green growth. So the feeling was um was fright or fear. You could say that, you know, maybe you are feeling terrified, you're feeling frightened, you're feeling fear. So the imagery is sort of one where the characters are feeling scared or frightened or terrified. Good. Part E says, what is the dominant impression and how is it created? So dominant impression means like, you know, the main feeling. When you read this, what is the main feeling you all get? And how, how does the writer create this feeling for us? So Joshua, tell me what you think is the main feeling, the dominant impression that you get from reading this, and how you think that main feeling or dominant impression was created. What did the writer do to create that main feeling? So Joshua said he didn't do this one. Why you didn't do this one, Joshua? Because it was hard? Anybody did this one? Anybody attempted this one and have a response? Oh, everyone thought that this question was difficult. So let's, let's look at this question. It says, what is the dominant impression? So overall, when you read this, what, what, what feeling do you get? So anyone, what feeling do you get, the overall feeling you get when you read this, um, this paragraph? What is the overall feeling? So Sushmata is saying fear. Very good, Sushmata. So how does the writer create fear in the story? Because it says, how is it created? So what does the writer do or what does the writer use to create fear? The um, use of vocabulary, the description. Very good. So by the descriptions that the writer uses, that is how the writer creates fear because of the vocabulary in terms of the words that the writer uses. So words like dark, mysterious, uh, impenetrable, dark green grove, creeping plants. So the vocabulary that the writer uses helps to instill that fear in you all. And also the descriptions, how the writer describes the overall setting helps to instill that fear. So the answer for E would be that the dominant impression is fear and this is created by the, by the vocabulary, so the words the writer chooses, as along with the descriptions of the um, varying aspects of the forest that the writer um, includes in this paragraph. And the last letter F says, what can you predict from the atmosphere about the development of events in the plot? So just from the atmosphere, we know that the atmosphere in this story is one of, from a fair, so we know that they are going on an adventure, but it's a frightening one. So if you had to develop the, um, the different events of the plot, like the rise in action, the climax, the fall in action, and the resolution, if this was the first paragraph of your story, how would you continue this story and what would happen? So I'm looking for a creative response where you, know, you, you get the opportunity to continue this story. What would be your rise in action, the climax, the fall in action, and how would this story end? Anyone's want, anyone wants to attempt this question? So 
So remember, the setting is usually found in the first paragraph of the story. So if you had to continue the story, what would happen from here? The, the story is just describing where Ojebet and her brother, they now enter into the forest. So what's going to happen next? They just entered the forest. What, what's going to happen if you had to create this story? Based on the fear that exists right now in the story. Sushmata, let's hear your response. So right now we know the atmosphere is one of fear and they just entered the forest. So what, what, what would you write next in your story? And how would your story end? What would happen in your story? Yes, I don't know. <laughs> Let's hear Joshua. Joshua, if you had to create this story, if they gave you this first paragraph and you had to continue writing the story, what would happen to Ojebeta and her brother? And how would the story end? Because we get a sense that, they, that they're scared right now. They're now entering into this forest. So why are they going into this forest? What's going to happen to them? And how is it going to end? So Joshua is saying that he thinks that they were lost. Good. So maybe when they enter into the forest, they got lost. And then what would happen after that? They lost in the forest. What can happen next? So you ever watch any movies or read any books where, you know, the characters got lost? Joshua is saying, and then they would face a few dangers. So if you're in a forest and you're lost, what, what, what kind of dangers could you face? What could happen to you that would be scary? What would you encounter in a forest? So um, Lena and Sushmita said wild, wild animals. So maybe when you venture into the forest, you saw like the wild animals and then you had to, so that would be the conflict, you were against an animal. You have to face a force of nature, so the animals and or snakes. And then afterwards, you know, you have to battle with this animal. So maybe you will get injured, maybe you make it out alive, or maybe you die. Um, Joshua is saying that rangers are looking for them. Good. So maybe you met up with some rangers. And if you're lost, then how are you going to get out of this forest? Did you make it out alive or you died? So Rihanna is saying that maybe they could have seen a cottage and then they asked for help. Good. And, but if you're in a forest, how are you going to get into contact with the outside world? because the, the possibility of like cell service is very low. So how are you gonna get um, into contact with the outside world and escape? Or Joshua is saying that maybe Ojebet and her brother were survivors of a plane crash. That could be a really exciting story that, you know, maybe they ended up here because they were survivors of a plane crash and they were trying to make their way out of the forest. And if you all were trapped in a forest, how would you all escape? What would you all do to communicate with the outside world? What do you all see people doing in movies or even in stories or novels? <laughs> yes, yeah, Sushmata says light a fire. When you are trapped in a forest, one of the easiest ways to send a signal, you ever hear people say um, send a smoke signal? They say that because um, if you're lost in the forest and you want to get in contact with the outside world, so the outside world would be that, you know, people don't necessarily venture into a forest on a daily basis. Maybe um, planes or helicopters will be flying over the, the forest. So an easy way of communicating with the outside world is that you could light a fire. So that you know you're, you're literally sending a smoke signal. So you can light a fire, then maybe someone comes, they rescue you, the air guard, someone can come and rescue you, and then after you return safely. Good. So you want to write about Hansel and Gretel. <laughs> You could have see one. I told you all that when you all watch movies or even when you all read books and stuff, you all could use the ideas that other writers um, include in their work and you all could even modify it, make it better and recreate your own stories. So let's look at the second one. The second one is on character. So remember character is very important because um, you know, we need to have people in our story or animals or things in our stories. So it says really closely the following character descriptions 
and answer the questions which follow each description. So as usual, we're going to read the questions first and then we would read the paragraph afterwards. So it says, which features of Lawson are emphasized in the description? So right off the bat from this question, we know that the character's name is Lawson and we know that he's a male. What contrast in the description does the extract convey? How does the director feel about Lawson and how do you know? What evidence is there to show that Lawson is insincere? So you like specific words and phrases to support your answer. Do you find this character credible? Why or why not? So again, you're going to jot down your responses for these questions and I will call on you all afterwards to give me a feedback. So let's look at the paragraph. Nor was there anything attractive in Lawson's appearance. He was a little thin man with a long sallow face and a narrow weak chin, a prominent nose, large and bony, and great shaggy black eyebrows. They gave him a peculiar look. His eyes, very large and very dark, were magnificent. He was jolly, but his jollity did not seem to me sincere. It was on the surface a mask which he wore to deceive the world, and I suspected that it concealed a mean nature. He was plainly anxious to be taught a good sport, and he was hail fellow well met. But I do not know why I felt that he was cunning and shifty. So from reading this paragraph, do you know what features of Lawson are emphasized in the description? So what parts of Lawson does the writer spend a great deal of time um, describing? So the facial um, features. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the first question, he does spend a great deal of time describing the facial features because if you look at the first three lines, sorry, the first four lines from Nord to Magnificent, the writer is basically describing his face because we get an idea. He says his face is long and sallow. Remember sallow, um, we learned this word last week when I told you all that sallow um, means a yellow pale, um, yellow pale in complexion, like if you are sick. So the writer spends the first few lines describing his face, how his face is sallow, his, his um, chin, his nose, um, his nose is large and bony, his eyebrows, even, and, and even his eyes. So a lot of the, um, the features of Lawson that are emphasized are his facial features. Good. Number two says, what contrast in the description does the extract convey? So remember, contrast has to do with opposites, right? So do you all see anything being contrasted when the writer is describing Lawson? So in the description, do you see any contrast? Maybe the writer says one thing and then the writer says the complete opposite. So that's a contrast. Do you all see any contrast taking place in this um, paragraph? So maybe the writer describes one thing about Lawson, but then the writer goes and says the, the opposite. It could be about his physical description or how he looks on the, how he is he on the internet. jolly. It says he's jolly. So jolly is like if you're happy. Uh -huh. And how does he contrast that? It did not seem sincere. Good. So the writer is saying that, you know, he was jolly, but then it doesn't seem sincere. Uh-huh. Well, again. He felt that he was cunning and shifty. Yes, he was cunning and shifty because one minute the writer is saying that, yes, um, Lawson is jolly, so like he's very friendly, he's jolly. Then the writer is saying that, you know, he was cunning and shifty. He also goes on to say that, um, that he feels that this was a mask to conceal his mean nature. So one minute the writer is painting like a positive image of um, Lawson, but then the writer is saying the complete opposite. Good. And number three says, how does the writer feel about Lawson and how do you know? So how do you think the writer feels about Lawson and what tells you that the writer feels this particular way about Lawson? Jada. So based on what the writer says about Lawson, the description, how do you think he feels? 
Um, he was when? The director thought he was when? How do you know that? Um, because how he does conceal like his nature. Mm -hmm. It was like two-faced. Okay, so the writer thought he was two-faced. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned weird. I thought that you were going to point out the fact where he said um, they gave him a peculiar look. Because the word peculiar means like weird or strange. So first of all, the writer thought in terms of his outer appearance that Lawson looked a bit, a bit weird. And, and now about him on the inside, the writer thought that he was two-faced. And how do you know that the writer said he was two-faced? What did the director say? Any particular line you read that, that, that sealed the deal that he was two-faced? Um, where it said it was on the surface, a mask which he wore to deceive the world, and I suspected that it concealed a mean nature. Yes. That part tells us that he was two-faced because the writer is saying that, you know, he was one way, but then the writer believes he was another. Very good. Um, Lena, you wanted to tell me something about Lawson. How does the writer feel about Lawson and how do you know? Um, I will say he was keenly anxious to be taught a good sport and he was a fellow. No. Right, hail fellow, well met. That's an entire expression that means um, sociable. So like someone who has a lot of friends and they're very sociable, we refer to them as hail fellow, well met. Good, and then we gotta, um, we gotta sense how the writer feels because the writer keeps telling us that, you know, he, he says one thing about Lawson, but then he tells us that, you know, I feel that, you know, he was this way and he was that way. So like when he says, I felt that he was cunning and shifty. Good. Number four says, what evidence is there to show that Lawson is insincere? So you like specific words and phrases to support your answer. So if someone is insincere, it means that they are very fake or they're false. So what does the writer, what specific words or phrases you all um, saw that really showed that Lawson was a bit false or fake, so he was insincere? So Joshua is saying he looked jolly. So first he looked jolly, uh-huh, but he was not. Good, because this line when he says he was jolly, but his jollity did not seem to me sincere. So here's where the writer is saying that, you know what, I think that this person is fake. And then there's a next part that also shows that, that he was fake. So y'all know the, like, the next line that shows that um, Lawson was insincere or fake? It actually comes at the second to last line when he says that he was plainly anxious to be taught a good sport and he was hail fellow well met. So he was very sociable and friendly, but I do not know why I felt that he was cunning and shifty. So the writer is saying that, you know, Lawson pretends to be very sociable, but I feel as though he was cunning and shifty. If someone is very cunning, it means that they're shy, that they're very sly and shifty, meaning that, you know, one minute he's one way and then he changes to another um, way. And the last one says, do you find this character credible? Why or why not? So remember, credible has to do with realistic, right? So do you think the way that the writer described Lawson and what the writer said about Lawson is credible? Why or why not? So um, Rihanna, do you think that um, this person, Lawson, is, uh, is a real character? He's something that we could relate to. Do you think he's realistic? No, I think he's very deceitful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because he, um, he showing like, you know, he good, but deep down inside, he's a bad person. 
And do you think that this is a character that we could find in the real world? Yes. It has oh, plenty, you know plenty to police it for. <laughs> right. So like when they say the character is credible, they mean like, you know, if it's someone that we could relate to in the real world. So I'm sure that you will probably know a lot of lessons um, that exist in the world today. So when the question asks if the character is credible, it means that, you know, is this a character that's realistic? Is this something that we could all relate to? And I'm sure that, um, that many of us could relate to Lawson, where we, where we know someone like this who pretends to be happy, who pretends to be very sociable and friendly, but then they are a bit deceitful, they're very um, fake, so they're very insincere. So I'm sure that this is a character that we could relate to, where we know, at some point in time, we have encountered a lesson. The next um, exercise is on dialogue. So it says dialogue and theme. So remember dialogue may be used to develop the theme of the story. Read the dialogue below. What do you think is a the theme of the dialogue? So I'm going to ask you all just from these few um, lines, just from reading the dialogue, if you all are able to tell me what is the theme of this part of this little story. And remember to pay attention. The theme could be anything from love, friendship, hate. So I'll be calling on someone to tell me what they think the theme of this little dialogue is. So it says, are you going to invite Katie Rostov to the school dance? I don't think so, answered Monty. Why not, asked his brother, Henry. I thought you liked Katie. I do, said Monty, rubbing the toe to his right shoe across the carpet. But, but what? Gee, Henry, she's not a very good dancer. If I take Katie, I'm afraid people will think I couldn't get anybody else to go with me. Henry snorted. You'd pass up a chance to go to the dance with an intelligent, witty, attractive girl because of what other people might think. Honestly, Monty, I thought you had more sense. So, based on what is um, being said here, what is happening in this, um, in this dialogue? Stephen, tell me what you think is happening here. I see it. I see it. I see it. Oh, I see. Okay, I think it. See ya. See what? What you think is happening in this um in this dialogue here? I don't know, Miss. Were you listening? Were you listening to us? Ah. A little bit. Yeah. Okay, let me ask Sushmata to um to help you out. Sushmata, what do you think is happening here? Um, hey. Who are the characters we have in this in this um dialogue? Katie, Russell, Monty, and Henry. Good. And what relationship does Henry and Monty have? Like, are, like, are they friends? Are they cousins? What are they? Friends. Uh, they're brothers. Miss. They're brothers. When it says here, why not ask his brother, Henry? So Monty and Henry are actually brothers, so they're siblings. And we know that Katie Rostov is the topic of discussion. And who is Katie? The kid they want to ask to the dance. Right, so Monty apparently likes Katie. And the school is having a dance, but we now find out that Monty doesn't want to ask Katie to the dance. And why doesn't he want to ask Katie to the dance? Because Henry now is, you know, trying to figure out what's going on here. She's not a good dancer. Right. So he, he likes the girl, but then she's not a good dancer, so he doesn't want to ask her to the dance. So if you had to tell me a theme that's, that's happening in this dialogue, I know Rihanna says fake love. Rihanna, why did you say fake love? <laughs> Because he liked the girl, but because she can't dance good, he don't want to carry her to the dance. That mm -hmm. is so deep. Yeah, so like he doesn't, he's not really sincere, right? I know Joelan, Joelan said that um, the team is peer pressure. 
And how do you know the team is peer pressure, Joanne? Because he thinks of what everybody would think of technical dancing together. Right. So the team, the team is actually one of the teams. The major teams is actually peer pressure, because um, in the bottom here it says, "I'm afraid people will think I couldn't get anybody else to go with me." And then Henry saying, "You pass up a chance to go to the dance because of what other people might think." So the main thing that's happening here is that Monty's feeling a bit of peer pressure because yes, he likes this girl. But because he is so afraid of what everybody else is going to think, that's why he's not carrying her. Do you all agree? I'm sure you all probably know people who have been in this situation before. Yeah, where, you know, where you like someone, but then because of what other people may think, you know, you try to shy away from them. And it's because you're feeling peer pressure. That's why. So his peers at school, they are peer pressure in him. And that's why, you know, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to go with Katie to the dance. Any other um, themes you'll see emerging here? So we have like the whole fake love. So like, yeah, he, he, he loves her, but then he, he doesn't love her when it comes to carrying her to a dance. We have the peer pressure taking place. So um, it's more like a teenage love too, because we know that they're, they're in school. And if your school is having a dance, like around this stage, if you're gonna carry someone, I'm sure that you know, they're maybe um, teenagers. So um, teenage love taking place here. So we see teenage love taking place here and we also see um, peer pressure taking place. Anything else you all see? They see a little bit of a sibling rivalry taking place here because Monty and Henry, they are, they are brothers, right? And then, you know, Henry's getting really upset because it seems as though, you know, Henry knows how much his brother likes this girl. And, you know, his brother is just falling into the trap of the peer pressure and not pursuing anything because of what other people might think. The next one is dialogue and plot. So from reading the, um, this passage, we know that dialogue may be used to develop the plot in the story. So it says, uh, read the dialogue below, and there are two main questions. It says, what is the main incident in the dialogue? So there is some sort of incident taking place here. And which lines of the dialogue help to develop or advance the plot? So if you had to advance this plot, what lines you would use to give you a cue as to, as to the direction in which a story could go? So it says, what has taken the cup so long to find that monster? Linda said for the hundredth time since this nightmare began two months before. Well, it's probably not their only case, Dan said quietly. He never knew exactly what to do with Linda when she got like this. I mean, I'm sure they're doing the best they can. The best they can, she screeched. How can you say that? Half the time when I call, I have to explain all over again who I am. They're idiots. I'm sure they're frustrated too. They want to find the guy who did this, I'm sure. Why do you always take their side, she cried. It's like you don't even care. That's when he shut down. How could she say he didn't care that they'd never see their 19-year-old daughter alive again? It was too much for him to bear, that's all. He sank deeper into the chair and closed his eyes. So what do you think is the main incident that is taking place in this dialogue? Joshua, what do you think is the main incident that is taking place in this dialogue? Somebody did a heinous crime to the daughter. Someone did a crime to the daughter. What kind of crime? And they're taking you know, something, but they can't find him on. But remember, in the, part, the last part, they said that he didn't care. They'd never see their 19-year-old daughter alive again. So where is the daughter? I think she died. <laughs> so, so Rihanna says she died? Probably somebody murdered her or something. Or maybe... Joshua said murder as well. But Joanne is saying kidnapping. Kidnapping. Mm-hmm. 
because they said that um, what is taking the cops so long to find that monster? And we know that this happened two months ago. And then they're waiting to see if they will see their daughter alive again. So it appears to see um, to us that the daughter was kidnapped. And maybe this monster, the man, probably was in contact with them. So they're trying to find the kidnapper. And if they find the kidnapper, then they will potentially find their daughter. So the incident that's taken place in this dialogue is that a kidnapping has occurred. And the kidnapping is one that occurred where the 19-year-old woman has disappeared two months now. And they're waiting to see if the police will be able to find the daughter. And what, what is the relationship between Dan and Linda? Uh, husband and wife. Yeah, they're husband and wife. Because Linda is the mom, Dan is the husband, right? And we know that they have a 19-year-old daughter alive again. And how do they feel? How do Linda feel about the entire situation? And how does Dan feel frustrated. about Frustrated. Yes, Lena? Linda. Linda was frustrated. Yes, Linda is extremely frustrated. She kept calling over and over and it's the same situation. She keeps explaining to the cops and nothing is being done. Good. So Linda is extremely frustrated because, you know, time is going by. She wants to see her daughter. The cops are not taking her seriously. And how does Dan feel about the situation? How is he responding to the situation? Which I feel Dan set up all that. Why do you think Dan set it up? <laughs> Because everything Linda saying, he just shutting she down for the cops. And because if I call the cops five times a week, mm -hmm. you're supposed to have me on record. I'm yeah. not supposed to explain myself who I am again every time I call. Do you and think he that he's just trying to be um, level headed and not trying to work up the situation? You know, not trying to get Linda a little more frustrated. He's just trying to see if he could calm her down. And I, he, he, he has a big plot to it. <laughs> so maybe that could be a plot twist that probably Dan actually sat on the Or maybe they have insurance. Dan just sits there and closes his eyes and sits on the chair and then doing nothing. Mm hmm Yeah. Rihanna, you were going to tell me something. Maybe they have insurance money to collect. <laughs> So there are many ways that the story could go, which leads to number two, which says, which lines of the dialogue help to advance the plot or develop the plot? So based on, on, what, on what is being said in, the, in these specific lines, what would you, what would you um, interpret those lines to mean and how are you going to continue the story? So if you had to continue the story, what lines or what the characters said would you use to show the outcome of the story? So I know that um, Stephen said that maybe in the end, Dan could have um, contributed to the entire situation. Maybe he planned the entire thing because of how he's responding to Linda. So like, you know, like how he's saying that, you know, it's probably not their only case. They're doing the best they can. So what again do you all, what lines do you all see here where you all could develop or advance the plot and say what's going to happen eventually? Anybody wants to share what they think will happen eventually in the story based on what is being said in this dialogue? Joel, and if you had to continue this, this um, story using this dialogue, what would happen in your story? And what lines you would use from this initial dialogue to contribute to the outcome of your story? Um, the daughter would have, would have died. The daughter would have died. And, and what, you, what lines you use from this dialogue to, to get your idea? Um, because of the woman always in police and not having no word on um, finding her daughter. So maybe in your story, you found. would kill the daughter, so they find her dead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good. Um, Jayla, if you had to continue the story, what would happen? What's going to happen to the daughter? What would happen to Dan, Linda? What can happen in your story, Jada? I think they would find back. They will find her back. But it would like have a huge twist there. Like, I don't know. 
actually with it actually being the mother or it could actually be the father or it could be the police uh-huh and what about if if maybe the the twist was the daughter actually ran away with the monster because maybe the monster was her boyfriend was or something thinking that too yeah and then you know she, the daughter didn't want to be found <laughs> Because that has happened plenty. Yeah, that happened a lot in kidnapping, especially with um teenagers. Because um she's nineteen, so you know she reached a stage where you know maybe she wants a relationship, and then you know parents don't necessarily approve of relationships. So maybe that could happen. The plot twist could be that you know the monster is actually the daughter's boyfriend, and the daughter was trying to run away from home, and she wasn't kidnapped. And maybe when they find her, she she chose not to return home with the parents because she's over eighteen and she made that decision for herself. You never know. Anybody else has any other ideas that they would um, create? Or maybe a week later, they could find out that the daughter died and the mother could go into depression and commit suicide. You know? Uh-huh. Because of how the mother was feeling so frustrated. Yeah, probably she was depressed. Good. And even with that... Anne... next one. Yes, Jada. Um, the, they could have reported the daughter dead. And then, then the um, mother will commit suicide, but then after they find out the daughters are alive. Oh, no. <laughs> and even with Dan, too, because they, look, look how Dan is responding. Yeah, Dan looks like he is the fault of everything. And it could be the the child dead. And then he felt so guilty and turned the gun on himself with all that pain and guilt. Yeah, because in the, in the end, when it said it was too much for him to bear, he sank deeper into his chair, closed his eyes. He seemed as though, you know, he reached a stage where he's almost ready to give up. He's frustrated. He can't take it anymore. So if if was anyone had to commit suicide, it probably might be Dan first and then the mother would do it because the way how Dan is responding here, he seems as though, you know, he can't handle this anymore. He fed up with Linda. He fed up with everything. So good. The third one is dialogue and character where um, we actually see the character Lena in this. <laughs> so it says dialogue and character. Dialogue may be used to develop the character in the story. So it says read the dialogue below. So the two questions are, what do you learn about Lena from the dialogue? And which lines in the dialogue reveal aspects of Lena's character? So based on what is being discussed here, we get a sense as to um, character development, the type of characters um, Lena, is and also with um, Effie because Effie is her friend. So let's hear what they say about them. It says, you are in love with Costos, Effie accused. No, I'm not. If Lena hadn't known she was in love with Costos before, she did now because she knew what her life felt like. You are too. And the sad thing is you are too much of a chicken to do anything about it but move. Lena sank into her covers again. As usual, Effie had summed her up completely has summed up her complex, anguished mental state in one sentence. Just admitted Effie pressed. Lena wouldn't. She crossed her arms stubbornly over her pajama top. Okay, don't, Effie said. I know it's true anyway. Well, you're wrong, Lena snapped babyishly. Effie sat down on the bed. Her face was serious now. Lena, listen to me, okay? We don't have much more time here. You are in love. I've never seen anything like this before. You have to be brave, okay? You have to go and tell Costos how you feel. I swear to God, if you don't, you will regret it for the rest of your cowardly life. Lena knew this was all true. Effie had hit the mark so blatantly, Lena didn't even bother refuting it. But F, she said, her voice belying her raw agony, what if he doesn't like me back? Effie considered this. Lena waited, expecting, hoping for reassurance. She wanted Effie to say that of course Custos liked her back. How could he not? But Effie didn't say that. Instead, she took Lena's hand in hers. That's what I mean about being brave. So, hey, this is a real life story, worry. <laughs> <laughs> Lena, this is a real life story. All right, let me answer it. All yes, right. Lena, let's hear. Okay, I think... Um, I learn about she's, Lena in the dialogue. <laughs> she's been peer pressured by her friend. Uh-huh. And really, she has feelings for the person, but she don't want to show it and stuff because it's pain and rejection she's afraid of. 
Uh-huh. So she's very frustrated. Uh-huh. And uh, where the, that comes pain because she's afraid to tell the guy how she really feels about him. But if she afraid she, she gets turned on and rejected. So yeah. Yeah, and they even say that she's that she's coward, right? That she's, yeah. um, she's not brave because she's not the kind to like someone who would vocalize it. You know, you have some people like that, like they could like someone a lot, but they would never actually say it or actually confront the person. So we get a sense that Lena is a bit of a coward. She's very shy. She is not brave. She's not like Effie because Effie is the kind who is very bold and would go right up yeah. to Costos and tell Costos. But Lena is a bit more reserved and she doesn't want to, you know, to let everyone know her business. So that's why she doesn't even want to come out and say to Effie that, you know, she likes this person. I think she's being pressured too. Yeah, she's being peer pressure because, you know, Effie is just trying to tell her, you know, do this fast. We don't have much time. You need to tell him. And this is a team with love too. Mm -hmm. Very good. And number two says, which lines in the dialogue reveal aspects of Lena's character? So based on all the the, um, the descriptions we have of Lena's character, which lines show you about um, tell you about her character? So let me hear from um, Sushmata. I didn't hear from you in a while. Which lines here tell you that you know maybe Lena is coward? She's shy. She's reserved. So how do you feel about Lena? Which line you um, got your impression from? You are too, and the sad thing is you are too much of a chicken to do anything about it, but hope. Yeah, so that line tells us that, you know, she she is very, she's a coward because she's a chicken. Good. Um, Stephen, any line you see here that tells you about no, Lena's character? I said Yeah, chicken. Stephen? This is Lena, that chicken. So, um, let's hear another response. Lena, that chicken, Joshua is saying, um, how she is shy and, um, you know, it's actually hard to tell the person how you feel because sometimes they just mess you up. So maybe, you know, she's trying to protect herself. Because she knows that, you know, maybe the person would really mess up and, you know, maybe she will get rejected. So, so that, could, that could potentially happen that, you know, maybe she's just trying to protect herself. So. We also know that, um, do you all think that Lena is lacking self-confidence? That she's not a confident person, maybe she's a bit insecure? Yes. And how do, which line tells you all that? Mm -hmm. The um, fact that she needed reassurance. Yes, the line that says Lena waited, expecting, hoping for reassurance. So just the fact that she needed someone else to reassure her and, you know, that she was good enough for this person shows that, you know, maybe she's a bit insecure. She is, uh, she's lacking some confidence because she doesn't even believe that she's good enough for Costos. She needs her friend to reassure her and tell her that, you know, okay, yes, you are good enough for him. He would like you. So... We get the sense that, you know, maybe she is a bit, um, she's lacking confidence. She's probably insecure about herself. Is there anything else about Lena you all, you all notice? Do you all think that maybe she is afraid of Effie? Do you all get the sense that maybe she's afraid of Effie? Because if someone was not, was trying to, was pressuring you all like that to say something, you all might be bold and, you know, tell them to just leave you alone. But but she was... Effie um, may be big in size. <laughs> yeah, because she seemed like, oh, you know, she was afraid she to stand seems up. Like, Effie seems like she's a bully. Yeah, because, and, and, and poor Lena, she wasn't um, tough enough to stand up to Effie because Effie was so persistent telling her, you know, yes, you like him, but Lena didn't even snap back at Effie. Lena was actually, she actually kept her, herself composed pretty well. So maybe, you know, Lena is, um, you know, she, she was even shy to defend herself to stand up to Effie. And the last exercise on dialogue is dialogue and conflict. 
So you know that sometimes when we when we read what characters are saying, it helps to showcase maybe some sort of conflict that the characters are facing. So it says dialogue may be used to present a conflict in a story. Read the dialogue below. The first one says, what is the conflict? And is the conflict resolved? So we know that some conflict exists in the story and we need to figure out if it was resolved and how do we know that? It says Ron and Nicholas were arguing about the importance of education in today's global society for almost 20 minutes. Their voices became louder as the argument progressed. Then Ron said something which changed the tone of the argument. It's not vital to attend college to become an educated person, he said. Certainly, Nicholas replied abruptly. Why are you now saying certainly after your opposition to this idea all the time? I never said that attending college is important. My argument is that some form of studies is necessary after high school. Well, I never disagree with that idea. My point is that people can become educated without going to college. If you had made this point clear, we'd never had have this argument. I'm not taking the blame. It was your duty to make your view clear. After a brief pause, they both burst out laughing, realizing they were arguing about why they were arguing. So just from, just from reading this little extract, what is the conflict that is being that is taking place in this in this dialogue? The importance about education. Yes, they are arguing about the importance of education. And what specifically about the importance of education are they discussing? The, the tone of argument. There's something about the importance of education that they are discussing. They have different views about something. About in today's global um, society. Not in today's global society. Joanne, I think you were saying it. About attending college. Yes, they, they were actually discussing about attending college. And if the main thing was if you need to attend college to become educated. And that's what, yes, so they were discussing the importance of education, but the overall thing that they were discussing is if you need to attend college to become educated. And uh, do y'all think part two says, is the conflict resolved and how do you know? So after they arguing and arguing and arguing, do y'all think the conflict was resolved and how do you know? Joshua, do you think it was resolved and how do, how do you know if it was resolved or maybe it wasn't resolved? Miss, I think the conflict was resolved. And how do you know that, Stephen? Because coming down to the last three lines, they agreed upon what they was um, talking about. So they, so they did agree, uh -huh. and something else they did as well that tells us that you know what, this conflict was ridiculous, and we're good now. So they both bust out a laugh. Yeah. The part that they said, after a brief pause, they both burst out laughing, realizing they were arguing about why they were arguing. So just the fact that you know, they actually reached a point where they were laughing and then they realized that they're arguing about why they were arguing. That tells us that you know what, they actually were able to resolve their conflict. So we know from just this part that yes, the conflict was actually resolved. And the last exercise is on plot. I have this here to show you all that um, how to actually create a plot outline. So you know that sometimes you all, you have to plan your, your short story in the exam and then you don't know how to plan your story. So if you want, you could actually plan your story like this using a plot outline where the outline just gives like a synopsis about what is taking place. So it says compose a story using one of the following plot outlines. So I'm just, we're just gonna go through the plot outlines to see if you all agree with it, if you all think the story could have been better. So A says there's an engine malfunction, then warning to passengers, panic on board, 
attempts to calm passengers tire on wings of aircraft, emergency landing, and people waiting to assist. So what's happening in the story here, and how would you all end the story? After the emergency landing and stuff, what, what could happen? The aircraft blocked. What could happen, Stephen? The aircraft blocked. Because you know sometimes when they have the emergency landing, maybe you all don't land safely. So maybe the aircraft could have blown up. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the emergency landing, something went wrong. The plane crashed into something on the ground. People died. The loss of engine. Mm -hmm. And what could happen? How, how did the engine start to malfunction? Did it happen naturally? Did somebody tamper with the plane? It could be both ways. Yeah, um, so maybe, maybe if you want to make a story more exciting, you can say that someone actually tampered with the plane and that's what caused the um the engine to, to malfunction. Part B says you return home after a night out, home in complete darkness. You ring the doorbell, no answer. Shadow scene, figure lurking behind the bushes. You use the cell phone to call the police station. Police officers arrive in five minutes. Searchlight all over, figure seen behind bushes, and then you attempt you attempt to apprehend the person. So let's go to the end of the story. If you reach home, home in darkness, you see somebody in the bushes. Who's gonna be this person? After the police come, they search for the person, they find the person. Who is gonna be this person? Someone who escaped from prison, maybe a escaped felon. Okay, so someone who escaped from prison, uh-huh. Who again could this person be? If you really want to put a twist to your story. Who a could burglar. This be? It could be a burglar, uh-huh. It could be the person that, that you're living with. So why so why were they hiding in the bushes to do what? Who knows? Could I try was actually trying to scare the person. Yeah, because you know sometimes we, we see in the movies like you know, like a prank gone wrong. Yeah. So it, it could be like a prank gone wrong. Maybe it was actually somebody in your family who was just hiding in the bushes trying to um frighten you, but then you know you react to then you call the police and the prank just went wrong. So as what I say, that child. And, and where did this child come from, Sushmuta? Is that a child who probably was lost or a child who got kidnapped and they probably dumped the child in the bushes by a house? Or Joelan is saying that maybe it's a stalker. It could be someone who followed you, who followed you home, who's obsessed with you and they're stalking you and maybe they actually come to try and kidnap you. And the last one says, uh, blazing sun, fouls in the ocean. You are attacked by pirates. There's a vessel nearby. You call for help. The boat rammed. You jump on raft for safety. Spotted by Coast Guard vessel. You explain the situation. You follow pirates and then there's a speed chase. So if this happens and you'll follow the pirates and there's a speed chase, how is this speed chase going to end? Up? What's going to happen? How would the speed chase end? Rihanna, how would you end the speed chase? If you got up by the pirates and the Coast Guard came, they found you, you explained to the Coast Guard what happened, and then you all tried to chase only pirates. What would happen at the end of the speed chase? I have no idea. You don't know what happened? You never see any movies like this? Yeah, Pirates of the Caribbean. And what happened at the end of the speeches? I don't know, miss. I didn't watch it out. <laughs> Anybody knows how they would end the story? The exciting part would be the speeches and then what will happen afterwards? Joshua, I'm sure you, you, you could think of a way that you could end the story. The exciting part. So Joelan is saying that maybe the pirates got away. Oh, 
and you didn't get back anything. So the pirates could actually get away and you didn't you didn't get back anything, so your loss. Or what again can happen? What if y'all actually came face to face with the pirates close by and maybe there was a shootout? Who would have died? Who would have lived? So maybe if there was a shootout, maybe the pirates could have um, died and then the coast guard and you all survived and you were able to retrieve all your belongings. So perhaps that could have um, happened where you all were able to get back your belongings. Or it could have been a shootout, maybe you died, the pirates actually got away and the pirates move on to their secret island to share up the treasure that they accumulated from your, um, from your robbery. So if you have to plan a short story, um, so like when we learned about how to plan to write a letter, how to plan the argumentative essay, when you are planning your short story, you could use an outline like this, where in your outline, you just have like the main parts of the story. And then while you are writing the story, you're able to fill in between the spaces about what's going to happen there. So it's good to actually plan out the entire story. And we do this by using an outline where we, where we, where we trace the story from beginning, middle to end. And the last thing I have here before I give you all a break is that um, I have a sample short story for you all. It says, the question says, faced with this moment of truth, I began to panic. What if I was wrong? Write a story that includes the above sentences. So remember when the question says to write a story that includes the above sentences, it means that at any point in time in your story, you have to include these sentences just as they were. So faced with this moment of truth, I began to panic. What if I was wrong? Write a story that includes the above sentences. So let's see what happened in this story. The graveyard was cold, dark, and dreary. One wary old oak tree leaned over the entrance gate and broken battered headstones were scattered all around. I could hear the sound of the howling wind and the creak and groan of branches as they swayed in the storm. The smell of fey and rotting leaves filled my nostrils and I swallowed deeply, afraid I would get sick. As I walked towards my brother's grave, I heard another noise. It was slow, heavy footsteps. I turned. A tall, muscular man was walking towards me. His face was tough and covered in stubble to hide the scars which crisscrossed his jaw. I don't think this is such a good idea, I shouted over the wind. It's too late to change your mind, the man replied in a low, threatening voice. Either we dig him up now or you spend the rest of your life wondering how he died. Okay, okay, I mumbled, afraid to say anything more in case the lump in my throat would cause tears to run down my face. I can still remember the day those two army officers arrived at my house to tell me my brother was dead. Their cold, hard faces gave little away when I asked how he died. Killed in the course of duty was all they would say. Everything else was classified. They handed me a letter from my brother, saluted, then turned and left. The click clack of their shoes on the pavement slowly dying away. I stood frozen to the spot, dazed, confused, and devastated. I finally opened the letter with trembling fingers, fingers, but only one line stared back at me. I'll always be with you, brother Carl. What did he mean? How could he be with me ever again? He was dead. Now I leaned heavily on the rusty shovel in my hands and started to dig, determined to uncover the truth. The scar-faced man beside me began to dig at the other end, and soon my brother's coffin began to emerge from beneath the layers of sudden it. Faced with this moment of truth, I began to panic. What if I was wrong? I knew Carl hated the army. I knew he wanted out. His girlfriend, Sarah, hadn't turned up at the funeral, hadn't contacted her family in the two months since his death. But maybe she just needed some space. I looked down at the coffin as my hired helper tugged at the lid with a crowbar. With a loud snap, the lid flew back, revealing the frozen corpse inside. My whole body filled with relief. There was a dead man in the coffin, but it wasn't my brother. 
So there are a lot of mysterious stuff happening in this story. We know that Carl received a letter from his dead brother, the army officers delivered it. But then the letter said that, you know, he will always be with his brother. And some strange things happened where the brother died, but then all of a sudden the brother girlfriend didn't turn out to the funeral. She didn't contact her family in the two months since the brother's death. So what's happening in the story? If you had to write a part two to the story, what would you write? The brother faked his death. The brother faked his death. And how, how do you know the brother faked his death? They said that he, want, he always wanted to um, get out of the army. He didn't like the army. So it could be the brother faked his death. And who would help the brother fake his death? His girlfriend. his girlfriend could have helped because all of a sudden yeah, your boyfriend she died, never... but you didn't come to the funeral. And since your, bro your boyfriend died two months now, nobody saw you. So maybe um, she actually helped him fake his death. And where we were we together? And um, there's um, truth to be told because um, something they're covering up. They're covering up something. Oh, so, so maybe he faked his death to cover up something. And him and the girlfriend, they, they're probably on some island somewhere. Yeah, because when she opened the cover, coffin, it wasn't her brother. So she automatically know something is wrong. Uh-huh. Jada, I think you wanted to say something. I feel the army men help him too. Yeah, because then the army men act strange. When they came, all they said was he died in the line of duty and that's it. So maybe yeah. for him to get out of the army, maybe those two men were his friends and they actually helped him get out. And maybe um, they found out something suspicious with his crew members, other crew members. That's why he wanted to get out. True. Maybe something was taking place inside the army base then. He, he no longer wanted to be part of it. So that's what he was trying to get out. Or it could even be that maybe maybe the two army men could have done something to the brother and the brother's girlfriend because of how the brother and the girlfriend were so close. And she probably would have figured it out because they, maybe the brother told her a lot of information about what was taking place in the army. So they got rid of the girlfriend and him. You never know. Maybe that could have happened as well. So this is just to show you that, you know, in a story, there could be so many different layers. We got the description of the man who was digging the grave. Um, we got an idea about the setting with the battered headstones all over. So then the cemetery, we got introduced to the characters. We even saw some dialogue. And then we had that ending that was sort of a surprise ending because the funeral went, they had a whole funeral for this person. But now they're actually going into the coffin and they realize that this is not the person who passed away. So we're continuing with this question that's on my screen. Um, this was actually this year's January 2020, question number four. So remember for um, CXE under the short story section, you could get two different types of essays. So last week we looked at the picture essay where an image is presented onto you and you have to write a story based on the image. But then there's another question where it's called the prompt essay where they give you a prompt, a few lines, and then they tell you to write a story that includes these sentences. So let's look at this year's John question. It says, Mr. Matter was a well-known and respected member of the community, but lately he had become quite withdrawn. No one could explain the change until the day the stranger arrived. Write a story which includes these sentences. So right off the bat, let's look at the question again and then I will get your feedback as to what you all would write about. So Mr. Matter was a well-known and respected member of the community, but lately he had become quite withdrawn. No one could explain the change until the day the stranger arrived. Write a story which begins, which includes these sentences. So remember, whenever the question says to include these sentences, you could put it anyway in the story, in the beginning, the middle, or the end, because they didn't specify if to begin the story with these lines or end in these lines. 
So right off the bat, anybody wants to tell me what they would write about? We have this person and his name is given, Mr. Matter. We know of his demeanor. He is very, he's well known in society. Everyone respects him. But then all of a sudden he is a bit withdrawn. He's, he is very distant. He's not being his usual self. And people couldn't really understand why this was taking place until one day when they saw a stranger who arrived in the community. So who could be the stranger? What could happen to Mr. Mata? Why did he become withdrawn and so distant from everyone? So what would you all write about? Um, I thought a death in his family. So maybe there was a death in his family, that's why he became distant. And when the stranger arrived, who was the stranger? Um, stranger was him? No, well, he said that in the community, he was there, and then there was a stranger arrived oh. in the community. So the stranger is, so if there's a death in the family, maybe the stranger is like a family member who the community members are now seeing for the first time. Joshua is saying um, something like do little. <laughs> so it writes a storyline along that um, Joshua, something like, something like do little. Okay, good. Because I said that, you know, you all could use like situations that you all watched or read about and you can modify it and create your own um, short story. Good. Any other ideas about what you all write about? Jada, what you would write about? We always have a wild imagination. What would you um, write about, Jada? This one, I don't know. This one kind of hard. This one hard? This was yeah. this year's question, Jada. It could be um, he never spoke to his daughter in years and she could be the one who arrived unexpected. Good. So maybe, maybe, maybe he had a child or maybe what would have made it better, Lena, is if he didn't know he had a child and then all of a sudden he found out and that's when he started to be withdrawn and distant and then the daughter could come to live with him. And then everybody now understood why he was behaving that way because he didn't know he had a daughter. Good. Joelan, what would you write about? So Shmata is saying that maybe the stranger is Mr. Mata's enemy. So maybe there was someone in his past who resurfaced, maybe who was threatening him or something. And then the stranger arrived. So it could be like his number one enemy. Joelan, what would you write about? The first thought that came into my mind was um, the death of a family member. And maybe now he, um, the, fam the remain and the family members, they're going to live with him or something? Probably. Probably. <laughs> Anybody else knows what they would write about? It could be... Um... He's about to lose his mortgage and the bills mounting up and he saw the stranger. Um, Good, and the stranger could actually be who? Like someone from the um, bank? Yes. Very good. So yeah, may maybe he was living this life where, you know, you know, there are people who all of a sudden, like they're very popular in society. They're living, they're all out there. They're living this glamorous life and they're not really managing their finances too well. And then when push comes to shove and the situation gets really tough and unmanageable now, then they become withdrawn and then all of a sudden they just, be, they just start to lose everything. So maybe that happened with, um, with Mr. Mata that all of a sudden he started to lose everything and the first thing being his house. And when the stranger arrived, it probably was a bank coming you know, to take back the house because maybe he didn't um, pay for the house as he had to finish paying for the house. So that could be another um, situation there. Stephen, what would you write about? You don't know, Stephen? 
know? So I'm, I'm sure you know someone who was very popular, well respected in society, then all of a sudden they, they, they change, then a stranger come. So what happened? Nothing. See, well, that's what you write about, nothing. So if you got this question, what do you, you want to write about anything? Okay, Joshua. Joshua wants to um, save you right now. So yes, Joshua. Joshua, did you want to save Stephen and tell us what you would write about? Okay, Joshua said no. Stephen, I guess you still have to figure it out. Thanks, Stephen. You never watch um, AXN where you watch Criminal Minds, Hawaii Five O, and CIS. No, no, thing, Miss. Stephen, this is this is no. like a typical episode in one of those shows where you know someone who in the community all of a sudden they they become withdrawn. Then a stranger comes. What will happen to the person? Maybe the stranger came to murder them. You never know, Mr. Yeah. Martha probably was receiving death threats. I think maybe his wife had died. Mm -hmm. And then he realized that his wife was cheating on him. Oh. When, you know, the other person came home. So the stranger who come would be like the wife's... That, um, yeah, that is the person that she cheated on. Oh well, what, um, some well something so. And maybe when he when the stranger arrived, probably was on the day of the funeral or something. Yeah, then he realized. Well, the husband realized when the wife was cheated and whatever. Because okay, maybe he good. was thinking that you know his wife was murdered. Mhm. Mm and then he realized well maybe his wife was cheated and that was the person she was with. Or maybe it could be that um. Another one could be maybe his, he and his wife was trying to have a baby and probably the when they was away for a while. Uh -huh. And when they when um they came back, they came back with the baby or something. I don't know. Oh, okay, like an adoption. Probably. Or it could be um the two of them commit a crime, they stole money from the bank and one tried to cut cut them up and that's when the stranger appear and trying like to cut one, maybe because you know the question did say he was well respected and stuff so probably he could have been a bit insincere in that you know he was painting this image for the community that he was this good person everybody respected him and then people didn't know that he was involved in a life of two crime. image mm -hmm. And then when the stranger comes, because you know it was like this deal going bad. You ever had someone? You ever knew someone who was well respected, and you never thought they were involved in any particular type of bad lifestyle? And then when they die, then you know, like all these skeletons come out, and you're like, "Wow, that person fooled me. I didn't know they were involved in those things." So maybe that could have happened, where you know he presented himself one way to the community. But in reality, he was um, someone completely different. Maybe he had this double life. And you know, like all the evil and the crime that he committed, everything was probably catching up to him now. So maybe that could have happened as well. So this question was just to give you all an idea about um, how the question came this year for the January question. And just for y'all to see um, along the lines in which CXC focuses on, from my observation is that usually when they bring the prompt essays, so when they give you all the lines, these essays are more so, um, they try to build up suspense. It really tests your creativity where you have to think outside the box. So like some of y'all would have initially thought that this question was difficult, but the questions that CXC like to bring, they're always along the lines of um, building suspense. And a good way to tackle that is that, you know, you could have a plot twist in your story. So try when you're writing your stories, not to make your stories too predictable. You want your reader to be amazed and intrigued throughout the story. But at the same time, you don't want your readers to predict the story and their prediction actually comes to life. You want the readers to predict the story, yes, but you want them to have that surprise and then where they didn't see it coming. Because usually when you write stories like that, they tend to be like the more memorable stories and the ones that usually get a lot of high marks in the exam. 
So any questions before we move on to correct the homework? So I gave you all for homework the June 2000 paper. And from completing this paper for homework, you all would have noticed that perhaps some of the sections in this paper, maybe it was a comprehension, a particular section in the paper, you all have seen before. Anybody recognize anything from this paper that you all did before? The comprehension. Which comprehension, Jada? Um, <coughs> this one. Yes, the first comprehension, you all saw that already. So this is what I mean when I say that, um, that when we are doing the multiple choice papers, that we need to, yes, there was a comprehension with the books actually. And this is what I mean when I say that when we're doing the multiple choice papers, we need to pay particular attention to the different sections because of how it repeats. And if you all look at the year, this paper was quite in the year 2000, which was literally 20 years ago. And the sections in this paper from 20 years ago are still appearing today. So like um, in the later years, probably like 15 years later, 16 years later, extracts from this, from this paper is still appearing in the multiple choice papers. So regardless of the year, it's good that we complete as many multiple choice papers as possible because a lot of these sections are repeating themselves. So I'm sure at some point in time, maybe this year for your exam, you may see probably a section from this paper appearing in your exam. Because CXC has been resurfacing a lot of old material as well. So it's good for us to start from as far back as possible and work all the way through because multiple choice always repeats. And this is across the board for all these different subject areas. So it's good for you all to do as many multiple choice papers as possible, even not just the recent ones, but the older ones as well. So um, how many of you all timed yourself when you all were doing this um, paper? The time says here it's one hour and a half. And with the timetable that CXC released, you all would have seen that for your multiple choice paper, you do have one hour and a half. So I did suggest to you all that when you are completing this paper for homework, to time yourself, do it on one sitting, and to ensure that you took one hour and a half. So anybody um, actually timed themselves, they did it on one sitting, and they were able to complete the paper in an hour and a half or less? Anybody did that, or you all didn't time yourselves? Okay, so Lena says she took an hour and 15 minutes, very good. Joshua, how long did you take to do this paper? Did you time yourself, or you took the exact one hour and a half? Oh, Joshua took an hour, very good. Anybody else time themselves or you all didn't? If you all haven't been timing yourself, remember this month we're doing a lot of revision and part of revision is to ensure that you all finish the paper on time. Because what I don't want is that I don't want students um, running out of time and not being able to finish the paper. So Sushmuta says she took one hour, very good. So I want everyone from now on when I give you all multiple choice papers for homework, I expect that you all time yourselves. You do it on one sitting. Pretend as though, you know, it's the day of the exam. Do it in one hour and a half because that's all the time you have. At this stage in completing multiple choice papers, you're not supposed to be taking more than an hour and a half. So let's go to the, um, to the first section. So this section is, I'm sure, we have seen maybe some of these questions before. So this section is entitled synonyms and we know that a synonym is a word that is similar in meaning, right? So as the directions say in the following sentences, there is one underlined word and you have to select the option which is nearest in meaning to the underlined word. So whatever word you see underlined, you are finding the synonym for that underlined word. So how the correction of these papers will go is that I will call on persons to answer questions and when we reach like to the comprehension and so on, you all can um, answer questions when necessary. So for this section, the synonym section, I will pick one person to answer this section for me. So you would read all six questions. You, as you read each one, you would just read the question and tell me your answer. 
So to start us off, I will pick um, Sushmata. So you can start with number one. We greatly admired her for her follow. Yes, what you have for your answer? B, courage. Yes, the answer is B, courage. Good. Number two. A citizen is expected to show complete allegiance, allegiance. To, his, allegiance to his native land. D, respect. Not respect. That was a better answer. The bookkeeper said that our account. No, it's much better. I want you to give me the answer for number two. <laughs> it wasn't D. There was a better answer. D. Loyalty? Yeah. Yes, the answer was B, loyalty. Good. Number three. The bookkeeper said that our account was dorm dormant. Uh-huh. D, inactive? Yes, D, inactive. Good. Number four. The stricken family thanked the entire community for their benevolence after the earthquake. A, kindness. Yes, A, kindness. Good. Number five. The new employee seems to be a very zealous worker. A, untrustworthy. Not untrustworthy. The word zealous comes from zeal, and zeal means like if you have a passion for something. Like when you're feeling very passionate about something. So what do you think is the answer now? B. Be enthusiastic. Good. And the last one for you, number six. The earthquake caused widespread damage throughout the land, the island. B, unlimited? Not unlimited. A? Uh-uh. D? Yes, the answer is D, extensive. Good. Thank you, Sushmata. Anybody got all six correct? Me. Very good. Me. Very good. Anybody else got all six correct? Just remember yeah, the thing that now started. Huh? I get all six. Very good. So remember, this is only the first six questions, right? So we can't get more than one wrong in the first six questions because the paper has just started. So let's move on to the second section, which is the sentence completion. So you have to choose your word or set of words that best completes each sentence. So um, in this section, I would call on Rihanna. So you're gonna read the, the sentence and you could also tell me your response. So number seven. To conceal extra activities, the spy quickly something, a plausible excuse for his presence there, I put E. Yes, the answer is A, fabricated. Number eight. Banking has become the most something industry as evidenced by the huge profits re recorded last year. D? Yes, D, thriving, because thriving means like growing. Good. Number nine. Something people would not frequently change their wardrobe to keep up with their new trend of fashion. C? Yes, C, conservative. Good. No, okay. The journalists 10. were impressed by the something of the statesman whose, speeches, whose speech had a profound something on all who heard them. A? Not A. Um, B? Not B. Okay. What about D? Yes, the answer is D. Because eloquence means like fluidity, like fluency. So, um, so based on how someone is actually delivering the message in terms of their speech. So the best answer was D, eloquence and effect. Number 11. Her criticism was constructive and honest with no something whatsoever. Um, B? Yes, B, malice, because malice means hate. So B, good. Number 12. 
are you trying to something that all along he knew of the plot throughout the com committee? Uh, but D? Yes, D, insinuate. Because insinuate means like imply. Good. Anybody got all correct in this section? All six correct? No one got all six correct? Me. Very good. A lot of these questions um, have appeared in previous past papers. The next section is spelling. And I hope that you all did not use your dictionary for this. And when you all sat in, you'd actually time yourself. You're not using your phones and you're not using your dictionaries and so on. You're just using your brains. So as usual, for the directions, the, there are ways that are underlined. You have to pick if there's an error in the spelling or if not, if the sentence is acceptable as it stands. So for number 13, I would like Joelan. Are you back with us, Joelan? Yeah. Good. So you would do the section for us, starting with number 13. You read the sentence and then you tell us which word is spelled incorrectly or if there's no error. Practice for beginners. In this course, will commence at precisely 10 o'clock. A. Yes, practice. A. That practice is supposed to be the one with the C, E at the end. Good, number 14. When, when you are com compiling the estimates for recurrent expenditure, do you include breakage? Um, D? No, there's an error. A. No. C? No, the answer is B. <laughs> Recurrent has B. one C and two hours. All right. Um, Number 15. The deafening noise blared from John's cast. Cassette. cassette recorder cassette recorder was seemed intent in incessant 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 yes the answer is c incessant has two s's good number 16 the corporal investigation investigated and you know, investigated in court of the burglary. A. A, good. Corporal is missing an R before the um, P. Number 17. The zealous spectator experienced great disappointment when his favorite team lost. A. Yes, A, zealous. Zealous has an A before the L, and we did see this appear in the first section. And number 18. After the incident, the boys traveled a different route back to school. C. C, good. The front has an E between the F and the R. Very good, thank you. Did anyone get all correct in the spelling section? Me. Very good. Me, miss. Very good. Joshua, I hear him from you. Me. One wrong, okay, good. Very good. The next section is where we are getting into the first comprehension, which was a passage that we all did before, because this came on your midterm paper last year. So I'm not sure if you all remember this passage, but this passage was about the books, where they were basically talking about um, the feeling you get when someone enters into your home and they're staring at your bookshelves and they ask for a book borrow. So this story is all about, you know, the, the uh, um, anticipation that you feel, the apprehension you feel towards lending people a book, just because you know the extent in which you all went to, um, to get that book. So number 19 says, according to the writer in lines one to eight, what is the most frightening thought that occurs when a guest stares at your bookshelves? So, Jada, what you had for number 19? B. 
Number 19 is B. He will ask to borrow one of your favorite books. Very good. Number 20 says, the guest looks from title to title as from girl to girl and overheated dance hall. This comparison is intended to do what, um, Rihanna? I perceive. Number 20 is not C. Oh. Um, B. Mm -mm. Okay, well, I don't know. The answer is actually A, anticipation, because it means that you know that, that something is about to happen. So for number 20, the answer was actually A. 21 says the writer uses a series of short sentences in lines five to seven to convey a feeling of what, Joshua? For number 21, what's the purpose of the short sentences there? So Joshua says A, yes, A is the answer for number 21. Very good. Number 22 says, the writer in paragraph two, so lines nine to 14, describes in detail how he obtained the book in order to do what? So why did the writer describe this in detail for us, um, Sushmata? C? Ah, not C. B? Not B. One more try. A? Yes, the answer is A. To explain why he's so attached to the, to, to the book because he's providing an explanation as to, you know, to the extent he went to accumulate the book. Number 23 says, the word mind in line 14 is written in italics because the author wishes to emphasize, uh, to emphasize what, Lena? Why did you write the word mind in italics? I will say D. Yes, D, because he wanted to emphasize how much he minds lending his book to his friend. Number 24 in line 18, the writer uses the square brackets to indicate that the word in these brackets do what? Stephen, 24. Yes, the answer is C. Very good, because it contradicts those words not in the brackets. 25. Are you deaf? You guess that, Stephen? Yeah. Good guess. <laughs> 25. One has books, one has friends. They are bound to meet. This implies that it is what, Rihanna? D. 25, not D. 25? Yeah, 25. When they say they are bound to meet. They had D, D as in dog? Yeah, yeah. No, that's not the answer. Not A too? Not A. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> about C? No, the answer is B. Inevitable that books will be borrowed by one's friends. And the meaning of inevitable means bound to happen. 26, paragraph 4 indicates that Charles Lamb regard those who borrow books with what, Jolan? Jolan, number 26. How does Charles, um, does Charles Lamb feel about those who borrow books? Okay, so Joshua, you want to answer that question for Jolan? So Joshua has C, the answer is C, anger, because um, the word that they use there to describe how he was feeling, they use the word livid, and livid means extremely angry. So if someone is livid, it means that they're extremely angry. So the answer is C. Number 27 says, according to the writer, which of the following is true in the comparison of borrowing books and borrowing money? So, um, Sushmata, what you have for number 27? Number 27. A? Not A. Oh. 
D? Yes, the answer is D. The borrower of money becomes a slave to the lender. Good. Anybody got all correct in that um, comprehension? Miss, where's 24? Number 24 was C. Anybody got all correct in that comprehension? One wrong? Two wrong. Two wrong, good. Three wrong. This is a, that was a comprehension that likes to repeat itself. This next section is a poem entitled The Companion. And we know that if you have a companion, it means that, um, that the person is like your friend who is there to keep your company, right? So the poem says, the companion. Kata was her name, she was nine. I had no idea what I could do about her, but doubt quickly dissolved to certainty. I'd have to take this thing under my wing. Girls were in some sense of the word human. A human being couldn't just be left. The droning in the air and the explosions receded farther into the distance. I touched the little girl on her elbow. Come on, do you hear? What are you waiting for? The world was big and we were not big and it was tough for us to walk across it. She had galoshes on and felt boots. I had a pair of second-hand boots. We fought in streams and tramped across the forest, each of my feet at every step it took, taking a smaller step inside the boot. The child was feeble, I was certain of it. Boo-hoo, she'd say. I'm tired, she'd say. She'd tire in no time, I was certain of it. But as things turned out, it was me who tired. I growled I wasn't going any further and sat down suddenly beside the fence. What's the matter with you, she'd say. Don't be so stupid. Put grass in your boots. Do you want to eat something? Why don't you talk? Hold this tin. This is crab. We'll have refreshments. You small boys. You're always pretending to be brave. Then out I went across the prickly stubble, marching beside her in a few minutes. Masculine pride was muttering in my mind. I scraped together strength and I held out for fear of what she'd say. I even whistled. Grass was sticking out from my tattered boots. So on and on we walked without thinking of rest. Passing craters, passing fire, under the rocking sky of 41, tottering crazy on its smoking columns. And it says that this is a reference to World War II, which lasted from 1939 to 1945. So what was this poem about? Who are the characters in this poem? We have Keta, who is nine, and we have a boy. So what's happening in this poem? We know that it's after World War. And they're doing what? What, what are these two kids doing? Anybody knows what's happening in this poem? Want to give me a little summary of the poem? Jada, what do you think is happening in this poem? They're trying to get to safety. Yes, they're trying to get to safety because we know it's after World War, you know, the bombing is happening, a lot of fire, people losing their lives. So these two kids are trying to get to safety. Good. Number 28 says the episode described in the poem took place after a what? Stephen, after a what? See, when the episode in this poem took place after what? I see Stephen has gone. Um, Lena, this episode took place after what? D, bombing. Yes, the answer is D, bombing. Good. 29 says, the speaker's impression of the girl when he decided to take her with him was that she was what? How did he feel about um, the girl? Number 29. Sushmita, how did he feel about the girl? A. Uh -uh. He used a word to describe her. Feeble. What do you think the word feeble means? B. Weak. B. Weak. He thought that she was weak. Good. Number 30 says the speaker's attitude as revealed in lines 10 to 12 and 18 to 20 is one of what? What was his attitude like in those lines? 10 to 12 says, come on, do you hear? What are you waiting for? The world was big and we were not big. 
Um, 18 to 20 says the child was feeble. I was certain of it. Boohoo, she say I'm tired. She tired in no time. I was certain of it. So what's his attitude like? Lena, what, what is his attitude like? Let's see. Let's see. He was actually certain because he was saying that she was, she was tired. Um, D or what? It's not D. B? No, the answer is A, condescension. And condescension means if someone is displaying an attitude of condescension, it means that they're acting very bossy. And they're acting as though they have a lot of authority. So that's how he was acting towards the girl. He was very bossy. And he was, you know, pretending as though he had all the power. 31 says, which of the following best describes the speaker as he is revealed in lines one to four? So a pair of words you all had for this um, response. Joshua, what you had for 31? Joshua had A. The answer was A, disdainful but sympathetic. Disdainful is actually a synonym for condescension. If someone is disdainful, it means that you know that they are a bit bossy. But he was sympathetic in that he, he ensured that he carried her along. Although he was feeling that she was feeble and she would slow him down, she, he did carry um, the girl along with him. So the answer was for 31 was A. Number 32 says, at first the speaker thought that Keta would be a burden to him. Later, however, it is Keta who urges him to continue their journey. This is an example of what literary device. Anyone knows? First he was thinking one C. way, then afterwards it turned out another. C. Yes, C. That is actually irony. Because first he thought that, you know, she would slow him down, she was of no use, but then it turned out that she was the one who encouraged him to continue. So that's an example of irony. Number 33 says, the speaker and the girl were walking across the country because of what, Jada? C. C. They were looking for a safe place. Good. Um, put grass in your boots. Kata makes this suggestion to the speaker in the poem to do what? Why did, why did Kata said to put grass in your boots, Rihanna? Rihanna? I put E. For number 34, the answer is A, to block up the holes in his boots. Because remember, he said his boots were tattered, which means old. And um, he said it was a second-hand boot. So it was to actually block up the holes in the boots. Very good. 35 says, Kate has revealed in lines 26 to 35 of the poem can best be described as what Sushmata. A? Mm-mm, not A. In line 35 was when he sat, when, when she started telling him to um, put the grass in his shoes, um, eat this, this is crab. She started to tell him what to do. So how was she acting there? B? B, she was bossy, but she was resourceful because of all the things that she was telling him to do and the stuff that she was giving him was actually things that, you know, he needed. So the answer for 35 is B. She was bossy, but she was resourceful at the same time. 36 says, despite his feeling of tiredness, which of the following made the speaker keep on moving across the country? So why did the speaker continue moving across the country, um, Jovalan? Um, D? It wasn't D. B. Not B. A? The answer was A, fair. It was fair because at this point in time, he started to feel a bit um, scared about how Kata would respond. So he didn't want to, dis, um, to disappoint her because he didn't know how she would get on because remember, she started to be assertive and bossy. 37 says, in the last 11 lines of the poem, the speaker can best be described as what, Lena? So coming down to the end, how was the speaker? Um, C. C, he was proud because, you know, they mentioned his pride, but he was persevering in that he wanted to continue the journey. And 38, the fact that the speaker in the poem even whistled indicates that he was what, Joshua? Why did he whistle? Mm. 
Oh, the answer for Chirti, it was D. Yes, he was attempting to hide his feelings. So, you know, like sometimes when you're feeling a particular way, maybe you might do an awkward um, whistle, you might sing a line from a song. So the answer is D, he was attempting to hide his feelings. Anybody got um, all correct in this um, comprehension, in this poem? Yeah, Joshua on our roll. Joshua gets in everything correct. <laughs> Anybody got one wrong? So this next um, passage, I've seen this repeated a couple of times before for CXE. Um, this extract was on blind people. And they mentioned at first, they were talking about, you know, blind people with their disadvantages in terms of education and the employment. But then there's hope for them in that they said that the Australian inventor, he developed a computer for the blind, which allows them, you know, that now they could be ahead in terms of education and employment and not be disadvantaged. He spends a great deal of time talking about like the characteristics of this new device. And even, you know, highlighting some benefits of, about using this new computer, right? So, and the title says, Bringing the Blind Online. Because remember, online in terms of the computer, and online meaning that now they are on the same part as everyone else, because they highlighted that, you know, blind people are disadvantaged. So 39 says in paragraph one, the writer makes the point that blind people are what? Anybody knows what, what point does the writer make about blind people? That they're what? E. 39, yes, A, that they need exposure to disadvantages as practice for coping. Very good. 40 says, one can conclude from paragraph one that blind people are what, Rihanna? C. C, yes, they enjoy more limited opportunities than others. Good. 41 says, the word which best conveys the impression created but perhaps not for long is an exa is what um Jola. B? Yes, B hope, because now there is hope that you know blind people could now use this computer that was created especially for them. 42 says vistas in this context is an example of what Sushmata. A. What chat? D. Not D. Vistas mean like a pleasing view. Could blind people see? No. No, so then what device is that? Pun? Yes, the answer is a pun. It's a pun on the word vistas because blind people cannot see. 43 says, according to the passage, the talking computer is what? Do you know what you have for number 43? A. A is now a reality. Good. 44 says in line 22, a says is used instead of says in order to do what, um, Joshua? Why is a says used instead of says? So Joshua says B. Mm, 44 is not B. Try again, it's not B. Anybody wants to help? Um, Joshua, D. it's not C. It's not C and it's not it's A. D. Which means the answer is D, because when you're being assertive, you're being bold, right? You're being very strong and passionate about what you're saying. So the answer is D, to show how strongly Hudasek holds his view. 45 says, the writer's inclusion of the phrase to name a few in line 39 is used there. For what reason, Jolan? I don't know. So like when you're talking to somebody and if you have a lot of things to list out and you just say, okay, well, to name a few, why do you use that phrase to name a few? You ever talk, you ever listen or something and then after you say, well, okay, just to name a few, 
because they didn't want to go through the list of saying everything. So why, why, why do you use that line to name a few? See? Let's see. Um, a? Not A, there was a better option. You were close when you said C. D. The answer is actually D, useful and emphasizing the point that the functions are many. So because the, the functions are so many, you don't want to list all, but you just want to name a few. So the answer for 45 was D. 46 says the phrase so-called is used before fully contracted Braille to tell us that the writer what? Lena, what you have for 46? I had A. Yes, A is the answer. You know, like if, if, you, if you feel a certain type of way about something because you have reservations, you would just say, well, so-called, because they don't necessarily agree. So the answer for 46 is A. Good. 47 says the aim of paragraph 4 is primarily to do what, Rihanna? Um, C? Yes, the answer is C, to testify of the usefulness of the invention. Good. 48 says the idea conveyed in the concluding sentences of this article is similar to that of the what, Jada? So you have to compare like different sets of lines to figure out what's the answer. Which had for number 48, Jada? Yeah, number 48. Anybody wants to help Jada? I had A. Number 48 is A, the last sentence of paragraph one. 49 says the type of language contained in this passage is what Joshua. When you look at the language, so in terms of the words being used, this type of language is mainly what? What, is, what does this language entail? Joshua, did you say C? Um, the answer is not C for 49. The answer is actually A, mainly technical jargon. And technical jargon means like um, a lot of words that are associated with the particular topic. So like in this case, the, the, to the topic of discussion is the computer. So a lot of technical terms regarding the computer were listed here. So a lot of the, the, the words that were incorporated in this passage, like when they were talking about the features of the computer, all those things are technical terms. And they're technical because a com the common person wouldn't be able to figure out what these words mean or they wouldn't be familiar with, with this technical term because only those who have an understanding of computers would understand what exactly the writer is discussing when he's referencing the different features and all the um, functions of the computer. And the last one for this comprehension is 50. The main purpose of the writer is to do what, Jolan? Number 50. What do you think was the main purpose of the writer? Rihanna, you want to help Jolan? I put D. The answer is not D. Um, I will say C. The answer is not C. Joshua, you want to try? What about EMS? The answer for 50 is not A. <laughs> oh my God. Well, we know it's B. Yes, the answer is B, to highlight the achievement of a caring inventor. Because remember, he was mainly focusing on Hudasek and saying that, you know, this person did this for the blind people so that, you know, they could be afforded education and different opportunities. So the main purpose was to highlight the achievement of a caring inventor that now all these things that people wish would happen is now a reality because this person cared and invented so much time to um, create this device for them. So anybody got all correct in this comprehension? Anybody got one wrong? 
Two wrong. One wrong. Good. Three wrong. So this last advertisement, I've seen this repeated as well. Everything in this paper has been uh, repeated in different past papers, right? So it's an advertisement and it's entitled, Why People Who Own an STZ 723 Enjoy Driving More Than You Do. So just from reading this, we get a sense that this is a vehicle we're talking about because they are using the word driving. So this ad spent, a uh, spent a, a great bit of time and detail describing this vehicle, its, its features, who created it, about the performance and so on. Because it begins by saying that the owners are, so, they, so they're giving us an idea about who owns this type of vehicle. They said business executives, professional people, movie stars, royalty, and there's only one thing they seem to have in common, an, on a, an unabashed enthusiasm for the STC. So they're describing their enthusiasm, how they feel about the SDZ. They're saying that there's a rare relationship between man and the machine. Then they go on to talk about the luxury design, how racing engineers designed this vehicle. And they even said um, that under the hood, they gave us um, a bit of an insight about the features, about the engineering, about the three liter fuel injected masterwork. They even went on to talk about the suspension and all four wheels. And then to conclude, they said that the car is singularly enjoyable to drive. They even talked about its high performance luxury cars and any other manufacturer. And it concludes by saying, if you agree that extraordinary performance is the only thing that makes an expensive car worth the money, we suggest you call an SDZ dealer and arrange a thorough test drive. STZ, the best in driving machines. So 51 says the main purpose of the ad is to do what? So Jada, what you had as the main purpose of this advertisement? E. The answer is D, to make people want to own an STZ. Because they're trying to persuade you, telling you who drives the vehicle, trying to um, highlight all the features so that you will be persuaded to buy one. 52 says in lines one to three, the writer gives the impression that he is, that he is what, Lena? A. A. He is amused because he keeps um, talking about enthusiasm and, you know, he's painting this picture that, wow, this is so fascinating that this certain um, group of persons own this vehicle. 53 says, which of the following means most nearly the same as a sweeping assortment in line one? So, um, Sushmita, what you have for number 53? We're looking for a phrase that means the same or nearly the same as a sweeping assortment. C. What you have? C. 53, yes, is C, because assortment means different, like a variety. So the answer is C, many different types. Good. 54 says the advertisement places most emphasis on the STZs. What, Jolan? C? Yes, the answer for 54 is C, because they, they spent a great deal of time talking about the performance of the vehicle. 55 says the words prejudice reputation in line eight mean most nearly what Joshua? The prejudice reputation means what? So Joshua is saying A, the answer for 55 is A, extraordinary renown. Number 56, which of the following statements about the STZ 723 is based on opinion rather than a fact? So, um, Rihanna, what you had for number 56? C. No. That is actually a fact because it could be proven to be true that it costs more than the average car. Remember, opinions is how you feel because maybe, maybe um, someone else wouldn't have your opinion or your feeling. A fact is something that can be proven to be true, whereas an opinion is the opposite. It can be proven to be true or false. So what you, so what you think is an opinion? 
like when you're ready, the answer, you say, okay, yeah, this is how someone feels. Um, I think E. No, they did mention the suspension is independent on all four wheels. Uh, what about D? Yes, the answer is D. It is very enjoyable to drive. This is an opinion because one person might think it's enjoyable to drive, but someone else might say, okay, no, it's not really that enjoyable to drive. So the answer is D. 57 says, phrases such as an exceedingly rare relationship between man and machine and will spoil you are primarily designed to promote the SDZ as an automobile that does what, Lena? Um, A. Yes, the answer is A, it's pleasurable to drive. 58, by telling us that under the hood of the SDZ 723 world, the writer is mainly doing what here? Jada, what you had for number 58? A. Not A. Remember all those things that he is saying from under the hood, he's presenting facts for us, right? Why is he presenting the, these facts for us? C. No. And how do we be? No, the answer is actually B. Seeking to support his claims for the superior of the S. Easy. Oh, the answer is B as in boy. Because remember, he said before that it's pleasurable to drive. Uh, he's talking about the performance. So when he says about under the hood and he's given us all the features, he's actually supporting his claim that he made about the vehicle. He's actually presenting facts to show why, why, this, why this could be proven to be true. 59 says the main purpose of the title, why people you do, is to do what um, switch matter. What is the main purpose of the title? D. 59, it's not D. What is the purpose of asking a question? Because it was a question. A. Yes, the answer is A. To arouse the curiosity of the readers. Say, when you get the readers, you know, curious, trying to figure out, okay, what is so special about this vehicle? So that, you know, they would be curious enough to continue reading. And the last one, Joshua will answer this. It says the author suggests that the only feature that makes an expensive car cost effective is that it must what? So Joshua says B is not B, Joshua. What makes a car cost effective? The only feature that makes an expensive car cost effective. Anybody knows? A. A. It must be singularly enjoyable to drive. So put your total out of 60 for me and I'll get us so I can get a sense about how you all did. Calculate your marks for the out of 60. So you'll finish um, calculating your marks. So I'm gonna start one by one with you all. So Lena says she got 50, very good Lena. Just remember our aim now is to get 50 and above. And we shouldn't, even if we're not making the 50 as yet, we shouldn't get below 40. Good, so can everyone comment their marks so I can see your mark? Okay, good Joelan, Joshua, good. Very good. So everyone is getting above 40, which is good. 40 is our benchmark. Everyone should be making above 40 out of 60. Uh, we waited on Sushmata and Rihanna. Okay, Rihanna, good. I'm sure you made some careless mistakes there. Sushmata as well. So just remember that this is multiple choice, you know, in multiple choice, the questions are, the, res the responses, sorry, are extremely close. Sometimes it could just be one word, it 
can make the difference in the responses. But as we um, as we continue doing more, because we'll be spending a great deal of time the rest of this month um, completing as many multiple choice papers as possible. So I actually already sent you homework for you all in the WhatsApp group. Your homework is um, the June 2004 paper. So I sent another multiple choice paper for you all to complete for homework. What I expect is that, um, first of all, you all complete the homework on one sitting. I want you all to sit, time yourself, and ensure that you take no longer than one hour and a half. Even if you finish your paper um, in one hour's time, use that half an hour to check over because I want you all to practice incorporating um, checking over as part of the time. So if you are at home and you complete the paper in one hour, please sit for the next half an hour rereading, reread the passages again, reread your responses, ensure that that was the correct response. So even if you all, um, even if you all did finish it in the one hour time, use the half an hour to actually um, check over. The second thing is that when you all are completing your multiple choice paper for homework as well, I don't want you all to use dictionaries or any devices to Google answers. Don't use your phone, don't use your computers, your laptops, your tabs, don't use anything to Google answers. You have to get into the habit of um, you know, the exam mode. Just use your brain, think, focus, and do the, the papers for yourself. Don't um, Google any responses as well. So I expect that um, when we correct next week's homework, well, today's homework next week, I expect that you all improve um, with your mark. Remember, as the weeks go by, we can go down. Our mark needs to go up every week. And just an insight into what I'll be doing in next week's class. Next week's class, we will be starting paper three. So remember, you all are private candidates. You all um, did not do the SBA at school. Well, some of you all. So you, um, CXC has suggested that you all do a multiple choice paper along with a paper three. So next week, we'll be going through the paper three, how to um, coin your responses, We'll be going doing some analysis. Show, um, I'll be showing you all how to um, phrase the responses and so on so that you get as many marks as possible. So remember, now your marks will be coming from your paper one and your paper three. So you have that multiple choice paper to do for homework. Next week, we'll be going through the paper three and we will also be correcting the multiple choice paper that I gave you all to complete today. So do you all have, do you all have any questions regarding anything that was done today? Any questions? Everyone is clear. Just remember that even um, throughout the week, if you are doing your homework, you're doing your revision and so on, um, if any questions do arise, you could be sure to um, email me or you could send me a message so that I could answer your responses. Just remember that since you're being tested on multiple choice, a lot of the multiple choice questions repeat themselves and it's important that you all actually sit and revise the multiple choice papers, revise the passages, revise the questions and the responses. Um, so Shmatai, I see that you're asking what is the homework. I sent two documents in the WhatsApp group today along with a YouTube link. One of the documents is entitled um, Week 14 Homework. So I sent it in the WhatsApp group for you. If you don't get it, you can send me a message and I'll send it to you. So just be sure that you all spend enough time rereading your multiple choice papers, memorizing the answers, because the questions, when the extracts do appear and the questions do come, they come the same exit, they come the exact way and the responses are the same. So part of your revision is you all actually sitting down and revising your multiple choice papers along with the answers, memorizing the answers for them as well, so that if the, if the same passage comes and the same questions come, you would already know the answers, okay? So be sure to incorporate that in your revision as well. Are there any more questions? So if there aren't any more questions, you all enjoy your week and we would resume next week for class. If any questions do arise, you can feel free to message me, okay? Just continue being safe and staying indoors and maintaining your social distancing and spend a great deal of time practicing self-discipline 
where you will use your time at home to revise for your exams.